everybody. Good evening to you. It is the 17th of April, 2024. Nice spring day here in Boise. The sun's out. A little chilly. I hear if you're in eastern Idaho that it's been snowing today. Just got off the phone with my wife and she's taking our kids to soccer practice in the snow. So sorry about that. It is almost May, halfway through April. Uh, so good to have you here with us. Looks like people are still logging on. Please let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions, and we will answer as many of those as we can tonight. I'm Nate Eaton. This is Courtroom Insider. All during Chad Daybell's trial, we'll be breaking down the events of what happens during the day. You know, it is being live streamed. You can watch it. But there's just something different about being in the actual courtroom and seeing the mannerisms between the different players and seeing what happens when the cameras aren't on, right, before we start and after we start and seeing the reaction of the jurors. And so we'll be talking about some of that tonight, as well as what happened today during the trial. We have a lot to talk about tonight. We're following the money, honey. And... Uh, there was a lot of talk about money. In fact, the whole day today was about money. It was about flights. It was about Venmo transfers. It was all about the cash dollars that were floating around between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and Tylee Ryan and uh, JJ v Vallow and uh, even Alex Cox and some of these uh, people that are so involved in, in this case. Here's what we're going to talk about tonight. Two witnesses on the stand today. Uh, in fact, one of the witnesses was on there for most of the day, Chuck Consitis. He is a Rexburg Police Department detective. He really went through a lot of information today. We'll talk about it. What people think so far of the trial. I did some interviews with people in line outside the courthouse, and I asked their thoughts. Many of these people have come every day to this trial, and they were at Lori Vallow's trial last year, and I wanted to know what they thought. And I want to know what you think in the comments. So if you feel like sharing your opinion about the trial thus far, we are officially into it one week. They had opening arguments, opening statements a week ago today and went right into witness testimony with Detective Hermosillo. So we've been at this a week now and we know that we'll have two more full days this week. Um, and they're saying this could be eight to 10 weeks. So we're, we're just getting started, but we do have a week down. I mentioned we're gonna talk about bank accounts, credit cards, flights, Boy, Alex, Lori, and Chad, I hope they had frequent flyer miles because they were traveling all over the place. Timelines were discussed today. We're going to remember Tammy, JJ, Tylee, and Charles. I mentioned this last night and I forgot at the end because I was over time on um, sharing a, a bit about Charles Vallow. So we'll do that tonight. And of course, as I mentioned, we want to take your questions. Peggy is standing by to answer those questions. And I'm ready to go. So... Before we jump in about what happened today, I do want to play you some interviews that I did with people in line. This was at the courthouse yesterday morning, so this was before we had the testimony today. Just to give you a feel of what people in the courtroom are saying. And when I say people in the courtroom, these people that I interviewed, there's Ray, Janice, you'll see these people coming up. They've come to the court, if not every day, almost every day. I mean, these are the regulars. These are the diehards. And I just went up and I asked them what their thoughts were. And I want to share that with you tonight. All right, Ray, you are back for year number two. Two. What brought you back this year? Uh, same gig. I have Monday through Thursday off. And since I don't have anything else to do, I'm interested in the case. I'm more intrigued on what the new evidence is going to come in that we didn't see last year. Okay. So, I appreciate that you guys are broadcasting, rebroadcasting. It would be nice if you guys got some good cameras and audio. That's pretty much on you, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's. I wish. I wish. Um, so you, uh, what, what have your thoughts been? You know, we're only a couple days into this, but what have they been so far? Uh, underwhelmed. I, I'm not a big fan of the defense attorney. Uh, I think yeah, it's apparent that the judge isn't a big fan of how he's proceeded the last. Well, his first time at the podium. We'll be interested to see how things move forward from there. I don't know that you can teach him you know, dog new tricks, which means stop talking and there's a, an objection. Keep your mouth up to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, nothing new this year that they didn't have last year other than maybe the death photos. Right. All right. Thank you. Let's move down the line here. 
What are your thoughts? You were here last year a few days, what? more than a few days. About 10. 10 days. And are you going to come every day this year? No. No. I do have a day. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's brought you back? Why a second year? So much going on. Yeah. Just so cool. And what have you thought so far? Uh, as far as this, the, the so far this trial. This trial. Yeah. Seems a little anticlimactic to me for some reason. I don't know why. But there will be new witnesses, I presume. And, yeah. Uh, still interesting. Still like to be be here. And see right. But uh, I'll be here a few more times, but not as often as late. Not as often. All right. Well, good to see you again, you and too. good to see you all, too. Well, thanks. You came to Lori's how many days? Was it every day? I was almost every day, yep. And you actually slept out at the courthouse oh, yes. in Fremont. friends over here. For the I Senate saying hi, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so what, why did you all, and Janice, you can join in, too. What, why did you all decide to come back again for year number two, for eight weeks? Uh, I think just to kind of see it go through and see what they have on chat and if there's anything new and um, just really kind of I feel like coming supports the kids and that's what kind of we want to do and so we just come and want to hear new evidence and see bring to the table this time. Right. Janice, what about you? From day one, you were, weren't you first in line for that very first hearing? Yeah. With the, with the shirt that said, where are the kids? Wow. So I don't think you'll, there'll be any more sleepovers on the front lawn of the courthouse because we'll probably know the sentence here it, based on when the jury deliberates. But uh, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts about length? Do you think you're going to be here eight to 10 weeks? Until it's going now, for sure. It doesn't seem to get a lot done. A lot of objections. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be going really. Uh, yeah, we'll be here the whole time for sure. Yeah. All right, you're back out here too. This is your first day this year, right? Yes, sir, yeah. And and what brought you here? Uh, same thing. Just been following it. We want to see it to the end and make sure that everyone is victim of justice. I remember you were out there at, right after at Chad's house, right after the children were found making posters. W weren't you? I was out at Tom actually. Oh. But a, yeah, you were climbing telephone poles, telephone lines. What is it about this case that gets such your, your interest? What peaks it? Uh, I think there's a couple of things there. I mean, local, you know, and, and um, then when there's an event involved, that thing has been disappointed. Oh, I know. I just moved to Paris and I'm going to write about what I'm just going to do. Also, just seeing the justice system. I feel it's yeah. All right. Well, good to see you again. I know you didn't want to be on, so I'm not going to show you. But how about you? I don't need, even know if I asked you what brought you out here today. You've been here every day. Almost every day this trial. Yeah. I was, I lived in Arizona for Lori, so I didn't get to make it out. So I gotta be here for this one. So you did, you didn't come at all last year. No, I lived in Arizona. And how often do you plan to come this year? Any day I can. I'm not working or I don't have other commitments. But yeah. I've been here pretty much every day. I think I missed a day or two. Right? What have your thoughts been so far? It's really interesting. I love being here. Um, I think Pryor is doing a good job, like, smooching up to the jury. But I hope they can see that. Yeah. How long do you think that's going to be? I think it'll take a while. I think it'll be the next 10 weeks. Yeah. Okay, you're going to have your seat up there every day. And we know Tom. Hi, Tom. What are your thoughts so far? Uh, I want to see justice done. I want to figure out why this is happening. Get to the bottom of it. Are you thinking in your mind as a juror at this point? Uh, you know, are you putting yourself in their shoes or are you here as an solely an observer? A little bit both. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely uh, feel for the jurors and kind of what they're going through right now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All righty. Okay, so there's just a taste. Um, I did those interviews, I believe, yesterday morning, maybe Monday morning. So things have changed a little bit as far as I don't, I don't know if their opinions have changed, but as far as um, 
new stuff being presented into the trial. So uh, it'll be interesting. I'll kind of, you know, here and there interview people that are waiting in line. And if you have a really strong opinion and you come out to the courthouse and want to share it, be sure you flag me down and I'll be happy to get your thoughts on camera. And I'll try to do it in not as a noisy as place. I didn't realize that it sounded, it was hard to hear there. The, the courthouse is right on a busy street right in front. So um, we were kind of tucked away, but obviously not not good enough. So let's get to today. Here we go. We had Detective Chuck Concitus with the Rexburg Police Department and Michael Douglas, an FBI forensic accountant. Quick side note, when I was a young reporter back in like 2006, six seven, I was covering the Rexburg Police getting tasered. And I was there when Detective Concitus got tased. And I wish I had the video to show you. It was great. He, he screamed. I'm not, I'm not making fun of him. But, you know, here's this huge, tough guy. You think he's going to be tough and all together. He screamed, and it was pretty funny. Um, maybe one day I'll show it if I can track you down. And, by the way, I don't know if I would ever want to be tased. It just looked horrible. But, anyway, these are the two guys that were on the stand today. Detective Concitus, Michael Douglas, not to be confused with the actor, or Tammy Douglas, Daybell's brother. She has a brother named Michael. It was not him. And they spent their day talking about money. I have my notebook here. Detective Concitus testified that he had a warrant for a post office box at the Sugar City Rexburg uh, post office that Lori Vallow had set up. He went out to that post office box and he found about 100 pieces of mail in that box. And there was cell phone bills and there was bank statements and there was all sorts of everyday mail that you and I would get, credit card statements, things like that. Um, lots of bank stuff. And he basically went through all of the accounts that they could find that were registered to Lori and Chad and Tylee and JJ and when these accounts were opened and were they shared with Charles or were they separate? And there were a lot of bank accounts. There was a lot of, um, accounts that were set up long before this case even started. There were accounts that were set up after this case began, of course, there were bank accounts that Lori set up um, in the weeks before Tylee's death so that her Social Security money that we talked about last night could be moved over into this other account. And Detective Concitus went through that. One of the things that stuck out to me is he talked about Tylee and her bank account. So she had her own account where the money after Joseph Ryan, her father died in 2018, she started to get money deposited into her account every month. I think it was around $1,900. And um, Detective Concitus was able to pull the document of everywhere this money was spent and think of a normal teenager who has money and that's most likely going to match up with what Tylee was doing with her money. Here's just a sample of what the detective said. And was there anything significant about this document to you in your investigation? Yes, it uh, it shows uh, Tylee is very active on this account. She is um, spending money with her. Uh, uh, she is receiving death benefit stipends in this account from uh, her father, who Joe Ryan, who passed away. April 3rd of 2018. So Tylee was receiving death benefits and the, the death benefits were regularly deposited into this account. And Tylee was uh, very active in this account. When you say active. Well, she was out spending money uh, on almost on a daily basis. She was going to convenience stores, gas stations, shopping centers, fast food. And, and you stated this is the account she was receiving her social security payments in. Correct. Okay. So Tylee's spending like a teenager. She's using her card at brick and mortar stores, a couple of, of, of orders here and there online, but she's going to the gas station. She's going to McDonald's. She's going wherever, you know, teenagers would go. And they're able to track that activity on the bank account because she's using the debit card that is, is associated with it. Well, Lori goes on to change the bank from her Tylee's account to a joint account with the two of them. And the money starts going into this joint account. I believe it was in August of 2019. So a month before Tylee dies, the money starts going to this account with Lori and Tylee. What's interesting is that Tylee, that money would have stopped when she turned 18. So um, it's unknown if Lori knew that, that 
I, I would imagine she would have and that would it would have been explained to her but regardless Lori was able to cash get that cash get that money up until January so she got it August September October November December December and I don't know if they mentioned if she actually got it in January if that's where it ceased all in all she got twenty two thousand dollars between her benefits JJ's and Tylee's during these months when the children were no longer alive. So a, a pretty hefty uh, chunk of change there. Well, as I mentioned, Lori changed the banks. And um, there was a moment I want to play for you where Detective Concitus got emotional when, when Rob Wood asked him about some of these transactions on the bank accounts on JJ's account and on Tylee's account. Listen closely. You'll catch it here in this clip about how still to this day, it chokes them up to remember the day those children were found dead. Can you, with your pointer, identify the deposits made on September 18th? Yes. So there's two deposits made on that day. Um, one in the amount of 3000 $902 and the second for $4,157. And you see them here towards the bottom of the page right here. Uh, they were deposits from the Social Security Administration, Treasury Department. Uh, and did you see the X's here? You have a different last four number, the 9801, and then you have a C1. And then on the next line down, you have the 9801E. So we can differentiate what deposit belongs to by looking at this top one here, we have the 9801. So Charles Vallow's uh, social security number was uh, 436029801. And we see the C1, so that would be for JJ. And that's the monies that were received. So we have the, and the next one down, we know it's for Lori because we have the 9801, but the letter E is just a, an identifier saying that she is the, the child in care or the guardian. All right. And are those, those amounts, are those the regular monthly payments? These are not. These are the, the initial installments that were, she received back pay for both when she generated her paperwork back in August. And detective, was there anything significant about that deposit date to you? Yes. What is that? JJ was killed a few days later. On or around the 22nd or 23rd. So the deposit went in on September 18th and JJ died three or four days later. And you can hear the emotion in his voice. Something I'll never forget is after that verdict came down in Lori Vallow's case, uh, I walked out of the courtroom and I was in a hurry to get down outside to go live to, you know, talk about the verdict. And Detective Concitus was standing right outside of the courtroom and the officers lined the hallway. Detective Concitus had tears running down his face because this guilty verdict had come in. And I remember he, he kind of grabbed me. I went to shake his hand, but he grabbed me and gave me this big old hug. And when I say big old hug, it was big. Uh, it got me choked up that these officers had spent so much time and you can see to this day them even thinking about that week, that September 18th day when the money went into the account and then JJ's found dead it just uh, days late. Well, not he's not found days later. He's killed days later and then found so many months later. Detective Concitus talked about visits to Costa Vida, a Mexican restaurant here. They have good dressing, by the way. There was a visit to the Costa Vida in Rexburg on, in September of 2019 and one to uh, the Ammon store, on, which is right by Idaho Falls, on October 7th, 2019. Tylee's card was used at that restaurant, at those restaurants. And in addition to that, they, whoever went took her phone with her. So 
Tylee died in September of 2019, but that very month, her card was used at the Costa Vida in Rexburg, and they were able to determine that her phone was taken there, and again the next month taken to the Costa Vida down in Idaho Falls, just two days before Tammy Daybell was shot at. Um, John Pryor tried to to bring up the fact of, well, do you do you know for certain who took that phone? Could it have been Alex? Did you GPS search it? Did you do this? Well, he wasn't able to say 100% sure who took it, but they do know that after Tylee died, someone was using her card to spend money, and Lori was receiving money from the government, even though her daughter was dead. They And here's the one of the interesting things that came out about this is that Lori kept Tylee's Venmo account, and Colby, Tylee's older brother, Lori's eldest son, would text Tylee thinking it was Tylee, asking for money. And Tylee, or whoever had her phone, Lori most likely, would text back. And there were several transactions where Lori would transfer money to Tylee's account and then immediately Tylee, uh, Tylee's account would send the money to Colby. So it's it's as if Lori apparently was, was um, still giving the illusion that Tylee was alive and still sending this money over to Colby. And I think it will come out because it didn't hurt trial, these text messages that were sent to Colby from Tylee's phone after she had died. And Colby assuming that he was communicating with his sister, and he was not. There was credit cards. There was flights, a lot of flights booked for Alex and Lori and Chad. There were some flights for Tylee. There were some very few, there were some Southwest flights for JJ between Arizona and Texas when he'd go see, or uh, yeah, Arizona and Texas when Charles was living in Texas. And um, there was some uh, other, other places of expense. I know a lot of you were blown up asking about, not blown up, but messaging about the, the video being so dark. The reason today that the video is dark behind Chad or of Chad is the jurors asked if the blinds could be opened in the courtroom. And believe me, it is nice to have light in that courtroom, but it immediately washes out Chad and John Pryor, especially during the morning session. It was really bad today. So they tweaked the cameras at lunch and brought down a, like a shade and moved the camera. So it's a little bit better, but work in progress. Hopefully, hopefully we can get that clearer image. But I, I can also see the juror's standpoint, though, of where they'd like to have a little bit of light because it does make for long days. Let's talk about Alex and his money. Um, Alex had a pretty good job, according to the detective. He was getting paychecks two to three times a month. He was good with his money. They said he wasn't, like, blowing it all over the place. He'd pay off his bills. He'd pay for his loans or whatever he had. Made decent money, and then suddenly he quit his job in August of 2019. He went and he got a loan for $21,000. He was approved on that loan, and immediately he started buying guns. 46 firearms between August 10th and October 24th. Um, his regular income stopped. He moved when he moved to Idaho at the end of August, he never got another job. So, um, the interesting thing about this is that, um, that there was some discussion made that because Alex had that altercation with Joseph Ryan back in 2007, did that preclude him from ever purchasing a firearm again? And it seemed as if John Pryor wanted to open the door to go down the route that Alex illegally obtained these 43 weapons. But the judge said no, basically. The, the prosecutors objected and said, we don't think it's relevant to the case. And it was, again, he's not allowed to mention the Joseph Ryan incident but the the judge said no, but he could he did say it could come in on a limited scope. Like if it came up, if the detective offered up about Alex obtaining these guns, he Pryor could cross could cross examine on it. And Chuck, uh, Chuck Consitus did. Pryor asked about the weapons. Did he, was he aware of anything that would have uh, exempted Alex Cox from owning weapons? And and 
Consitus said, well, I know, I believe he was charged with something years ago, but it didn't exempt him from owning them. And in my research, I did find that he wasn't like, if you're a convicted felon, you're not allowed to have firearms or, or purchase them. But it sounds like on his record, they expunged it, but they don't call it that in Arizona. They basically set it aside. So whatever happened with Joseph Ryan, from everything I can tell, Alex legally obtained these weapons. I I, I might be proven wrong. I hate to say that because I can't tell you with 100% confirmation. But regardless, he obtained 46 weapons. Also, you can sometimes get these weapons at gun shows where they don't do background checks. We don't know all of the places he got the weapons, but he had a lot of them. Then we heard about Chad. He is the person on trial here, of course. And a request he made to a woman in Hawaii who was renting out an apartment or a condo. And he sent an email inquiring about it for him and Lori. And this is what he said. This was back in no early November of 2019. What day was this? email sent this date was sent the email was sent on november 8th let's see right here 2019 that was um, about three days after chad and lori were married in hawaii all right and who sent the email uh, the email address uh, sender is chad.daybell at gmail.com and who is the recipient of the email uh, julie black And what does the, can you read the body of the email? I can. It says, we are interested in seeing this property. Would the owners be interested in leasing this property to a clean couple with no pets or children? Please let us know. Thank you. Detective, why was, what was of note of this document to your, or why was this document significant to your investigation? Well, as of November 8th in this email, it's stating that Chad and Lori are, have no kids. And so we're out looking for the kids and they uh, put this in, or Chad puts this in a, in a body of an email saying that they don't have kids. We just found this to be odd. So there you go. It's in writing. He sent it to the landlord. She came to the police. I believe in January or February of 2020 and said, I've got this document. And Chad said they had no kids there. So we went on to learn about prescription drug searches. There is a database that law enforcement can search different states to find out if you or I have any prescriptions in our names. Some states, they only track opioids or highly addictive drugs um, or, you know, really strong painkillers. Like in Arizona, that's what they do. They don't track all the drugs. Other states, they track everything. Um, and I, I mean, you'd have to be law enforcement to get the subpoena. But what they did is they checked with Arizona, Montana, because police got a tip that Tylee and JJ may have been living in a compound in Montana. So they checked that out. They checked Idaho and they checked Hawaii. And they checked for prescription medications to Lori, to Alex, JJ, Tylee, Melanie, Boudreaux. Their aunt, their aunt, and it turns out there wasn't much there. There really wasn't much there. They did, they did do the search though. They were hoping to see maybe if JJ was on those drugs for his disabilities, for his uh, autism and ADHD and whatnot. And I think they were hoping to see that oh, the prescription did get filled in Montana or Hawaii. They must be there, but there was there was no activity on there. Um. There was some hotel hotel stays that Lori paid for in different states and travel that she paid for for Chad to go to Arizona and I believe Texas at one point. Remember yesterday we talked about that Texas trip? Well, it turns out he did go to Texas, the one where he was asked to go speak at a conference for the youth in the area of, of where Lori happened to be living. Turns out he went. Um, there was fraud happening, uh, alleged fraud, I guess I should say, when both of their spouses were alive, when Charles was alive and Tammy was alive, and continuing after their deaths. And then 
Um, there was there there was so much more to this, by the way, that again, Chuck Consida's testimony was three hours. So if you weren't really want to do a deep dive, go watch it. But I want to play a part where John Pryor got up to cross examine him. There were timelines that the detective prepared showing to kind of just lay out when this expense was made, when that expense was made. And there were key points in the investigation. And he included on his timelines such dates as when Chad and Lori got married, when Tammy Daybell died, when Charles Vallow died. And Pryor had a problem with the fact that the detective included Charles Vallow's death date on his timeline. And here's what he said. And it talks about Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met in 2018. Correct? Correct. Okay, and then there was a uh, flight to Mesa, Arizona on 1-6 of 2019. You Correct. See that? Was, that a business, was that a business trip for Mr. Daybell, do you know? I don't. Do you know whether or not he was appearing at a podcast on that day? I have no information on that. Okay, and then we go to 3-19-2019. Are you aware that Mr. Daybell may have been on a business trip that day? I was unaware. Okay. Um, were you aware of what Mr. Daybell's occupation is? He owned a Spring Creek Books. Okay. Book Published company. Books, right. Published books, sells books. Right. Did some podcasting and he also spoke at some events. Right. Yeah. So he would travel on occasion and you saw a history of that as well, that he would travel and go to various locations for, for various uh, reasons, correct? Yes. Okay. So we don't know what the purpose of that is. What we know is that he met uh, Lori Vallow in, uh, in uh, October of 2018 and that he traveled for a couple of trips. Okay. And then on the same timeline. Well, hold up. Sorry about that. Things just froze up. Let me, let me resume where we're at there. Uh, I think I have it right here. At various locations. For, for various uh, reasons, correct? Yes. Okay. So we don't know what the purpose of that is. What we know is that he met uh, Lori Vallow in, uh, in uh, October of 2018 and that he traveled for a couple of trips. Okay. And then on the same timeline, you put Charles Vallow's death back on July do with Charles Vallow's death doesn't have anything to do with Charles Vallow's death but why'd you put it on this timeline Just to show it from January of 2019 across the entire year or was it just to get a reaction from the jury so that they would say oh my goodness he's traveling and he must be going to see someone even though you don't even know where what he was going for right objection argumentative all right judge overruled that or judge uh, sustained that objection so Pryor's making a point as to why, why would you highlight Charles Vallow's death on this timeline? And also, how do you know where Chad was traveling? He traveled all over the place. He recorded podcasts. He wrote books. He spoke at conferences. Maybe he had to travel to uh, Arizona and Texas. John Pryor has admitted during this trial that Chad was having an affair. He said it. He said it. He said they were having an affair. Both of their spouses were married. He's not denying there was any sort of affair. And I guess if you get in front of that, that does cover up a lot of the questionable things here. And he has used that as a defense in some of these questions like, well, yeah, if you were having an affair and and you didn't want your wife to know you were having relations with another woman, you would get a cell phone that would a track phone from Walmart or from uh, 7-Eleven or whatnot. So what's so unusual about that? Um, so again, he's not denying that he had the affair. And, uh, you know, Consitus said I included that on the timeline just because I wanted, it was a key point in the investigation. And it shows the jurors, it shows all of us where things happened when. I do wish, and I know many of you have asked that, it, that image of that projector was clearer so that you could see. It, it, it is even hard to see in the courtroom. We're seated on the other side, far back. So it's hard to see those exhibits when they get up there. Um, At any time. But I know that, oops. 
November 29th that, um, of 19. It would be this is helpful the... to have those because uh, you can actually see what people are talking about. Okay. So next we have Michael Douglas. He's the FBI forensic accountant. He also went through all of the financial data. He also prepared timelines. He said that in the grand scheme of things, they were working with around 80 total accounts. And as I mentioned earlier, $22,545 went from Social Security to Lori Vallow's accounts after the death of the kids. $22,000. And he showed several timelines of JJ's accounts, of Lori's accounts, of Tammy's and Chad's accounts, of uh, Alex's accounts. He even had a timeline that said the grand theft timeline. Um, I want to play you this clip of him talking about Chad moving thousands of dollars the morning the cops showed up to search his yard for the children, the missing kids. Chad got on his computer or on his phone or made a call to the bank and started moving a lot of cash around. And Michael Douglas lays out what he was doing with, with these sums of these large sums of money in the weeks and days leading up to his arrest, including the morning of. This is uh, Michael Douglas, again, the FBI forensic accountant. November 29th of 19, this is the trip to Knott's Berry Farms. The information that we acquired from Knott's Berry Farms uh, included a ticket for Chad, five of his kids or uh, in-laws, as well as one for Lori. Uh, December 20th, the night. On those financial records, did it list the names of who those tickets were purchased for? So we, uh, Knott's Berry Farms was able to produce copies of the tickets that included the names of the individuals. December 20th of 19, Rexburg PD announced the investigation. Uh, I also noted that Chad had transferred $1,000 each to three of his older children, specifically the children that lived near him uh, in the Rexburg area. And when you say the Rexburg Police Department announced an investigation, uh, what investigation did they announce that day? At this time, it was the missing of the children. The children were missing at this time and trying to locate the children. And on January 3rd? On January 3rd of 20, this being the first search of Chad's property, I also noted that there were two transfers to Chad's middle son, Seth, uh, from one being from his business account, one being from his personal account with Mountain America, uh, to the tune of fifteen hundred dollars to his son, or again to his son Seth that day. Uh, March sixth of twenty. This is the date that Lori was extradited from Ida or from Hawaii to Idaho. On March eighth of twenty, Chad sells his Dodge Dakota and his Chevy Equinox to his two dollar to his two daughters. Uh, they both reimbursed him $200 each for both vehicles. And on September, or sorry, on June 9th of 20, uh, we discovered that Chad had transferred $8,000 each to his, again, his three older children that lived in the area uh, the morning of the search. And this being the same date that we located JJ and Tylee's bodies on the property. So in on June 9th, there was a transfer uh, of the $10,000 into Chad's uh, from his Spring Creek book account uh, that he had that we'll discuss in a second. Uh, the 10000 making the balance, this 20000 and change here, and then transfers to his son, Seth, on September, or sorry, again, uh, June 9th to the tune of $8,000, and then another transfer June 9th to his, uh, the account is in the name of Joseph Murray, but this is also his oldest daughter, Emma's account, uh, for $8,000 as well, leaving an account balance of the 4,400. So this one shows the savings account that was associated with Chad's personal account. And on the same date of June 9th, a transfer to his oldest son, Garth Daybell, an $8,000 transfer that date as well. Okay, so you see all that money is being moved around. There's a lot of money. And some of you are saying, where is that money coming from? 
Remember that Tammy Daybell had a $400,000 life insurance policy. And Tammy, or I mean, Lori was getting all that money from her, from her kids and her social security and all that. So I realized that, you know, today, if you watched, could be a little, not tedious, but a little dry or boring because it's a lot of facts and figures, but they're really laying the foundation of this money. And remember, Chad Daybell's charged with grand theft and insurance fraud. They've got to prove those things too. And they haven't gone to the insurance fraud part yet. They've kind of dabbled in it. But when the, the testimony comes that he went in a, a couple of weeks before his wife died and upped the insurance policy from the very minimum to the maximum, that's going to be interesting. At least I assume that's coming because it came in Lori Vallow's trial. So again, if you want to go back and watch all the testimony today, you can kind of, kind of get a put the numbers all together. We will begin tomorrow with Michael Douglas on the stand. Uh, I believe, yes, Rob Wood has more questions for him before John Pryor testifies. So we are up to, um, I believe, witness number eight, seven or eight. I need to get updated on my list. I'll give you an update tomorrow. Uh, we have an update on Koberger, by the way. If you're following the Brian Koberger case, I want to get to that in a minute. There's some breaking news that just came down in the last while we've been here, and I've just been reading up on it. I'll, I'll share the news with you. But before we do that, I would be, I can't forget this. This is Charles Vallow. And I meant to do this yesterday because Charles Vallow was such a pivotal part of yesterday's hearing, and I want to do it tonight. This is his obituary. Charles, Leland Charles Anthony Vallow of Houston left this life to meet his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on July 11th, 2019. He was born August 17th, 1956 to Leland Eli and Tilda June Vallow of Lake Charles. He was preceded in death by his parents and sister. He was a committed father to sons Nicholas Charles Cole, Zachary Chase, Zach, and Jackson, uh, or Joshua Jackson, JJ, and most proud that Cole and Zach earned their college degrees. Youngest son, JJ, age seven, is a child of special needs with whom Charles was adoringly engaged to ensure his success in life. Is a brother he positively impacted all our lives, going far beyond the call of duty and expecting nothing in return. We will cherish him forever. He was fun-loving, kind, understanding, and compassionate, a 1974 graduate of Barbie High School and attended McNeese State University, where he received a scholarship to pitch for the McNeese Cowboys. He was a member of Kappa Sigma fraternity and cherished many good times with his fraternity brothers. In 1975, as a freshman, he set up a new McNeese University record by striking out 13 batters in the first college game he pitched. In 1977, he was drafted to play semi-pro ball in Houston. A gifted athlete, he had a passion for physical fitness and was an avid fan of the Dallas Cowboys and Houston Astros. As an experienced financial consultant, Charles guided thousands of families to safe and secure retirements. He practiced a profession as he lived his life, relationships, integrity, communication, and service to others. At American Equity, he was honored for being a top producer and ensuring the financial health and security for many. Left to cherish his memory are his three sons, Nicholas Charles Vallow of Dallas, Zachary Chase Vallow of Austin, Joshua Jackson Vallow of Phoenix, and his siblings who are listed there. And then a memorial celebration will be held August 3rd at Lake Charles Civic Center. And so Charles Vallow, while not necessarily legally on paper tied to this case that we're covering here in Idaho, very much involved, and tonight we honor and remember him along with Tammy Daybell and Joshua J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. May they rest in peace, all of them. Okay, I want to get to your questions and some shout-outs. We have some news on Koberger. His attorneys were told, or, yeah, his attorneys were told by the court that today... By today, they had to file a notice of alibi, or it couldn't count. They already filed one, but it wasn't sufficient enough, from my understanding. They just filed it today at 441, and we, we just got our, that would be 541 our time. Let me read it to you. Actually, why don't I pull it up here? We can read it all together, and then you won't have to watch me. I am not an expert on Koberger. 
but I have thought about maybe coming to cover the trial if it's moved to Boise, or maybe it'll be moved to Bonneville County in Idaho Falls. Um, and if I do that, then I've thought about maybe doing Co Courtroom Insider for Coburger. And I don't know if that's any interest to you. You might be bored by, with me by then, but I don't know. I've thought about it. Let me read this with you. Uh, we're reading this together. I have not read this. State of Idaho versus Brian Koberger comes now. This was filed by his defendants, his, his defense attorneys. Comes now Brian Koberger by and through his attorney of record, Ann C. Taylor, public defender, and hereby files a supplemental response to the demand for alibi. Mr. Koberger moved to Pullman, Washington of June of 2022. As an avid runner and hiker, he explored many areas of the Pal Palouse. Of note, he explored Wawawai, I'm sorry, Park in July of 2022, and this became a favorite location. After the school year began, Mr. Koberger was busy with classes and work at Washington State University, and his running and hiking decreased but did not stop. Instead, his nighttime drives increased. This is supported by data from Mr. Koberger's phone, showing him in the countryside late at night or and or in the mornings on several occasions. The phone data includes numerous photographs taken on several different late evenings and early mornings, including in November, depicting the night sky. Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022 as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. He drove throughout the area south of Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including Wawawi Park. Partial corrab corroboration. So they're saying he's got someone that can corroborate this story. Mr. Koberger intends to offer testimony of Cy Ray, a cell tower, cell phone, and other radio frequency uh, the, in, the evidence is attached to show Mr. Koberger's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington, and west of Moscow on November 13, 2022. That his device did not travel east of the Moscow Pullman Highway in the early morning hours of November 13, and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop. Additional information as to Mr. Koberger's whereabouts are, as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis by Mr. Ray, will be provided once the state provides discovery re requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. If not disclosed, Mr. Ray's testimony will also reveal the critical exculpatory evidence further corroborating Mr. Koberger's alibi was either not preserved or has been withheld. Okay, so they're saying Koberger, instead of hiking and running like he used to do, would go for late night drives. And he was on a drive the night those four were killed in that house by U of I. Interesting. It sounds like this is going to go to trial. Sounds like if they've got an alibi ready to go, this is going to go to trial. And I don't believe they have yet set a date, but I'm thinking... If I were to guess, it could be next year around this time. And based on the fact that the Ada County Courthouse has now done two profile cases, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, I could see them possibly moving it here in the same courtroom as Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow's, which would just be insane if somehow I'm back here next spring doing another trial. Uh, I, I could be wrong, though. I mean, it could stay up there in, in northern Idaho. Maybe it moves to Idaho Falls. Uh, but I, I, it, it's, there you go. There's his alibi. What do you think? I know that doesn't have anything to do with Daybell, but I wanted to share that because it just came through. In fact, one of the headlines I saw as we were chatting was um, the fact that it's, it's a bizarre quote unquote alibi. All right. Time for your questions. But before we do that, let me do some shout outs. Here we go. Thank you all. Fan funding, Stacy Ann, thank you. Kim T, Deborah B, Marla Shaw, Andrea Woos, thank you all. And Dr. Vonda K, uh, who is a huge fan of Emmy, my daughter. This is for her. I share her interviews with my friends. Dr. Vonda, thank you so much. Who does Emmy have coming up tomorrow? Oh, uh, Emmy, my daughter, does interviews every week. It's called Seven Questions with Emmy. She's been doing this four years now. She's talked to Michael Buble, Henry Winkler, Drew Barrymore multiple times. Tomorrow, she's talking to John Barry, the country singer. 
So you can watch those. A couple of other shout outs, Jonathan and Jessica Severn, Jody Johnson, Irene and James Yoakum. Thank you for watching. Nick Core from the UK, Tori Meyer, Cindy Orgel, Matt Taylor, Martha Christie, Pam Keith, Radha from India. Wow. Steve Gross, Becky from Ireland, Randy Green, Travis Thor, and all the rest of you 12,000 people watching. Thank you for watching. Let me get to the questions. Here we go. Is it true that Chad has a photo of Tammy hanging in his jail cell from Sambia? I have not heard that. As far as I know, he does not, but I have not heard that. Amy says, what does demonstrative purposes mean? Good question, Amy. Demonstrative purposes means it's for a demonstration. It's not the actual evidence. So when they say we have a timeline for demonstrative purposes only, it doesn't mean that I mean, it's evidence, but it's to demonstrate. It's not like physical evidence that they collected. It's evidence that the detectives then put together to demonstrate the pieces of what they found. So it's still considered, but it's not like it'd be if they found a timeline in Lori Vallow's house and admitted it as evidence, that would not be demonstrative evidence. But if they put together the pieces of her bank accounts and made a demonstration, that would be demonstrative evidence. I hope that makes sense. That's a great question. If given the opportunity, this is from Jamie, to interview anyone involved with the Daybell trial, who would it be and why? T number one on the list would be Lori and Chad, but Lori would be toward the top and maybe it'll happen one day. I don't know. I hope. Chad would be good too. I, I do wonder how forthcoming they would be. Um, and I know we all have questions about why and what. I don't know if we'll ever get those answers. I'd love to talk to Chad's kids. I, 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 I would. I mean, regardless of what they have to say, I'd love to sit down with them. Um, I'd love to interview Summer Shiflet. I have, I have not interviewed her, but I will be doing that at CrimeCon in uh, end of May, early June. And if you want to go to CrimeCon, you can use the promo code EATON, E-A-T-O-N, and get 10% off. I don't make any money from that, by the way. I, I'll just be there. Um, but she would be a good interview. Um, I think those are the main ones. Chad and Lori, of course, at the top. And, and some of their circle. I've interviewed Melanie Gibb. I'd love to talk to Zulema. Oh, I'd love to interview Zulema. I've tried to interview Zulema. I've reached out to her. I have not gotten a response. What on earth is Chad doing behind his screen? It looks like he's typing. He is sometimes. He's typing. He's scrolling. He has the evidence up on his computer. Many of you have asked, why does he get a computer? Well, he gets a computer to go through the evidence, and that's what he's doing. Lori did not have a computer. She had a notepad that she would draw on or write notes, things like that. Every time there's a sidebar, Chad closes his computer halfway. Why is that? If everyone has the same thing. Does he get lunches every day? Where does he spend his hour? Um... Well, he probably closes his computer because during the trial, John Pryor is sitting next to him and he's blocking anyone in the audience from seeing the computer. And then when they have a sidebar and Pryor gets up, I think he closes it just to be sure no one in the audience sees it. That's just my guess. He does get lunch when we go to lunch. He does get breaks when we go to lunch, when we go to have breaks. Um, I'm not sure exactly where in the courthouse they put him. There's likely a private office area somewhere, and I don't know what they feed him. I don't know if they bring a meal. They probably bring a meal from the jail for him. The attorneys and the jurors and the staff working the trial get a different meal every day that's catered, uh, but I doubt Chad is getting that. I, I would ask, um, but there's a gag order, <laughs> so maybe when this is over I can ask. If date, this is from Mary, if Dateline offered you a chance to be a correspondent, would you accept? I think you would be a stellar addition to the show. Wow, that is a nice, nice compliment, Mary. I don't think they would ever ask. Um, I, those people are extremely talented. I, I don't think I have that sort of talent. And I love what I'm doing now. That being said, I am working on an exciting project with Dateline. And I'll tell you more about it hopefully in a few weeks. I can't talk about it now. But that, it, I, I, like, I like it. And I, if they offered me a correspondent role, I would hate to live, leave Idaho. But, you know, my, I, I guess my dream would be if I could go, you know, do a couple of shows a year for them and still keep my day job. I'd, I'd like that. But that's very kind of you to say. 
Does Chad ever look scared or even concerned? Ever? Kay asks. I haven't seen him. I, I did think in that video the other day where he's talking with Emma in the police car. I think he's scared. I think he's scared. He plays it off. He has the nervous laughter, but I think he's scared. But I haven't seen him in court at all. Heather, if we don't have a ticket, but there's clearly seats available in the courtroom, can people show up and get into the trial to watch the trial? Uh, that re Next week, they're no longer doing the, the reservation system starting Monday. It's just first come, first serve. And I think you can show up. However, they've blocked off the one side of the courtroom that's by the jurors, and they're not allowing people to sit there. I don't know if that's going to change. There was too much noise happening on that side of the room. So I think... You could try to show up and get in, and actually you could next week, but starting next week, but if, if you are a minute late, they close the door. You can't come into the courtroom after it started. You could try to get in on a break or at lunch. I will say the numbers uh, trickle down as the day goes on. After lunch, there's far less people than in the morning. But if you really want to come and see, you should. I would encourage it. Just don't take my seat. But I would say, really, I mean, if you're into this case and you can get to Boise, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to be there. And it's different than watching online. But please don't all swarm the courthouse because it is first come, first serve, and there's no preferential seating. Not that I should get it, but um, I would love to, I would hate to miss a day. Do the jurors get snacks? Are they allowed bathroom breaks? Milo says, yeah. And that's part of the reasons why the breaks are a little bit longer because there's 18 of them that they have to go to the bathroom. They're sharing bathrooms. They do get a snack. They get a soda or a water or whatever. They're fed lunch. And it, t it takes a while to you know file in 18 people every break. If Chad was so afraid of Alex and Lori, then why didn't he divorce Lori after her arrest? That's from John and Lizzie. I think you're talking about the defense tactic that Pryor is using that he was scared of, of uh, Alex and Lori. I don't know why he divorced her. He, he didn't try to divorce her. He tried to bail her out. He called people asking for money, begging for money so he could get his wife out of jail. Um, so that will probably be brought up. Amanda asks if the courtroom is mostly filled with reporters. No, uh, not on this time. There was maybe... Four of us today that were reporters, maybe even three. That's it. Uh, maybe five, actually, depending on the time of day. Most of the people there are just members of the public that are coming. Lori Vallows, there were far more reporters. I was reading a timeline for the case and just learned it took over 11 months for Lori and Chad after being arrested to be charged with murder. Do you know why? Yes, because they didn't have bodies in the first place. Lori was arrested in March. Chad wasn't arrested until June. And then they took this case to a grand jury. They took it to a grand jury because if you go to a grand jury, it's secretive. It's sealed. No one knows. We did find out. But no one knows the grand jury is happening. The grand, and basically what happens at a grand jury is it's just the prosecutor, not even a judge, just the prosecutor. And they go through all of the evidence, as much as they want or as little, and they try to present the whole story to the grand jury and then the grand jury decides if the people should be indicted if they should be charged and what they should be indicted with and then once they issue an indictment it's sealed until trial the other way that you can do things is the prosecutor could have decided to charge chad and Lori right away with murder and then there would have been a preliminary hearing, which would have been open to the public, and we would have gotten a sneak peek at some of the evidence. And then there would have been a probable cause document, which would have revealed a lot more of the evidence. So they went the grand jury route to kind of keep the information tight-lipped. It's a high-profile case. They do that a lot. They do it a lot uh, in high-profile cases. And then you really learn the information at the trial. And so that's, that's why it took them so long to actually be indicted on the murder charges. I look, but can't locate you. Where are you sitting in the courtroom today? I was right behind. I'll, I'll show you. I was right behind the prosecutors every day. It's different. Uh, they, I had my spot last year, every day this year that anything goes, but I will try to show you if you, was there anything? See me, whoops. I am right here, right here in this window. 
Maybe this right there. See me? I'm right there. Right between Lindsay and chat and Lindsay Blake and Rocky Wixom. I'm right there on the back row. And this is where they've blocked off. Uh, by the way, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm looking at I'm looking at the bottom of your screen um, here. This will show you. See my mouse? I'm right there. This side they've closed off. So people are sitting over here and then back in here. This was my seat last year during Lori's. I sat there so I could keep an eye on her and the jurors who are over on this side. So, yeah, I don't know where I'll be tomorrow, but I do like the spot. It's, it's kind of right there. You get a view of everything. I will not wave to you, but just I'll wave through my eyes. Uh, Nate, can the jurors go outside at lunch or during the breaks? I, I think they can. I'll find out, though. I'll ask. I think that there is a smoker's deck on the fifth floor, um, but um, I haven't seen them out there. Carla, I'm coming to court soon and need to know what you would recommend for a time to get in line. Well, I get there every day around 745 and I've had no problems, but it's you're, you wait in multiple lines. You wait to go inside and then you go upstairs and you get your ticket. You wait in that line. Once you get your ticket, you wait in another line to go in the courtroom and then you go in the courtroom. And then you kind of do that all over again after the morning break and the lunch break. So that's how it is. Uh, Laura asks if Lori is at this trial. And how do you send me and my team gift cards? Oh, you're very kind. We don't need any gift cards, but thank you for watching. The best thing you can do to support us is subscribe to our channel and follow us if you want. Um, Lori's not at the trial, and I don't expect her to be there. Is the same prosecution team that Lori had, is this the same? Uh, partially. Lindsay and Rob are the same. The prosecutors for Fremont and Madison counties, they are there. Rachel Smith, who was the uh, prosecutor in Lori's case, is no longer there. And instead, we have Rocky Wixom and Ingrid Beatty. She's with the attorney general's office. Um, so they are the, the assistants here in this case. Um, there was also some deputies last year that are no longer here. One of them is a judge now, and one is not here. Spencer Ramble's not here. Did Lori pay for Chad to travel to be with her, Pam says? Yes, it appears she did. They went through that today. Can you tell us if you've heard class Chad's? Uh, I'm not going to go there because that's, that's, that's unfounded. <laughs> Paul, what does Pryor get to eat? I have no idea what he gets to eat, but um, I did ask last year Jim Archibald and John Thomas as they were leaving the courthouse the first few days, what are you having for lunch? Because that's all they could talk about. They went to Winco across the street a few days and had some pizza, but then they stopped leaving. And I don't, we don't see Pryor leaving the courthouse at all. All right, guys, I think we got them all. Thank you very much. Sorry, thanks for putting up with uh, my allergies. My voice is a little hoarse tonight. It's, it's a, the blooming season for the, uh, the flowers here. Continue to follow us live every morning for the trial. Follow the live written updates if you want. Courtroom Insider is here. Feel free to like us and follow us and do all that fun stuff. And here's where you can find me. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, and East Idaho News YouTube, and our Meet in the Eatons YouTube. Thank you for all of you who are watching in all of those places. We'll be back tomorrow night to recap everything that happens. And um, yeah, that's it. Have a great night. Take care. We'll see you.